Mind Your Subconscious is the podcast that provides you with techniques and knowledge about your subconscious mind. The part of your brain that lets you control your ego and create an extraordinary reality with your thoughts. We invite meditation, hypnosis, NLP, EFT and other experts to help you master the most powerful part of your brain. Your host is Jennifer Schlüter, who quit her job as managing editor of 22 newspapers to travel the world and work online just after one hypnosis session. A nomad ever since 2016, Jennifer is now a certified hypnotist and helps people transform their dreams into reality. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Mind Your Subconscious. Today I have the pleasure of speaking to two incredible guests that I saw last year speaking. They were speaking last year at the Digital Nomad Conference in Lisbon. And then I came to find out that the girl who was speaking, Jackie, she was in the same program as my coach was in Los Angeles. So then I met Jackie and I invited her to be on the podcast and she brought Justin on as well because both of them together have founded the Flow Consciousness Institute. And today we're going to be speaking all about flow, how you can remain in the flow, why flow is important and why it is great and a little bit about the afterlife and a bunch of other stuff. So it's going to be a really interesting episode. I look forward for you guys to hearing it. So let's get started. Hey everyone, this is Jenny with Mind Your Subconscious. And today's guests are Jackie and Justin, and they're going to introduce themselves now so you know what they're doing. Awesome. Thanks so much for having us on here, Jenny. Uh, I'm Jackie Nectel, and I'm here with Justin Fairman, and we are the co-founders of the Flow Consciousness Institute. Yeah, great to be here. Thank you guys so much for coming on today. And um, can you guys tell us what the Flow Consciousness Institute is? Yeah, so the Flow Consciousness Institute, uh, we're basically a research and training organization, and we teach people um, how to live in flow, how to, how to run their lives and businesses in flow, um, flow consciousness more specifically, which is a little bit different than, than flow states. And we also do research into consciousness and the nature of reality and uh, you know, the cutting edges of a lot of different fields to try and figure out practical ways for people to take some of these incredible findings um, from you know, neuroscience, neurobiology, psychology, uh, you know, quantum sciences, and so on, and apply them in their lives and businesses for, for you know, greater benefit. A lot of times these fields have really interesting findings, but they're not very practical or they're kind of abstract. And so our job is to figure out how we can actually take that and, and make it into something that people can use for their benefit in their lives. And really to help people understand how their beliefs and perceptions are actually creating their experience of reality. So really, you know, aligned with what you do in working with the subconscious and, and excavating all of the, the beliefs and emotional patterns and traumas and things that, that are subconsciously driving people's behavior and influencing their actions and how they show up in the world and ultimately the results that they're getting in life. So that is really amazing. That's a really amazing job or institute or what you do, you know? So how did you get into this? How did you come up with this? What led you to do this? Yeah, well, uh, Jackie and I had each been on the flow path independently. So we'd each been doing work with flow um, with one-on-one -on -one with different clients and kind of doing our own research and, and trying to understand how flow worked as a concept. And, um, and we were each doing that for a few different years independently. And then as, as it would happen in flow, there was a series of synchronicities where Jackie got introduced to me through a client of mine that she met in New York for lunch on a whim. And uh, we, we, we met out here in California and started talking and uh, I don't know, <laughs> How do we want to go into the story yeah. today? It's, <laughs> it's a great story, but yeah. yeah, and the essence of it is there was there was a profound resonance in, you know, just in, uh, in this knowing that we we have, you know, this work to do together and um, synergy in what we were teaching, and we just knew from that moment that we should collaborate. And you know, a few weeks later, we started co-creating and and developing our teachings and trainings together. That sounds great. That sounds very, um, 
like it had a lot of synchronicities in there. And so, Justin, you were mentioning earlier there's a difference between flow consciousness and flow. Uh, yeah, flow consciousness and flow states. So, basically, um, you know, flow states are what most people have heard about when they they hear about flow. Uh, at, at least in the mainstream, you know, if you're if you're pretty spiritual, you might have a slightly different conception of flow than traditional flow states. But uh, basically, flow states. If you if you look at what the word state means, a state of being is a, is a temporary state of being. So it's a state we enter into when the conditions are right, or when our when our our minds or our consciousness are in a certain you know, brainwave state or certain pattern, and we're in that state while those conditions are present, while we're in this brainwave state, while we're in you know this heightened this heightened space of awareness, and then when it's over, we kind of return back down to our normal level of consciousness. And so, that in a nutshell, is what a flow a flow state is. A flow state. It's basically this state of expanded creativity, heightened awareness, heightened sensory perception, um, a place of deep insight, maybe peak performance, depending on what you're doing. And so it's this temporary state that comes on when the conditions are correct um, and, and when we, we enter into these different altered states of awareness. And then it goes, and then you go back. Flow consciousness, on the other hand, is on the other end of the flow spectrum. So flow consciousness is not so much about uh, being in a certain state per se, it's more about a stage of development. So in psychology, you have uh, states and stages. And a stage is more like a deeper psycho-spiritual uh, level of development that people enter into. And so flow consciousness is really about how we live in flow all the time. How we take it not just from this, this uh, experience of being in a peak state, but really uh, an integrated way of living where we get to experience flow ongoing 24 seven throughout all areas of our life, business, relationships, career, whatever, you name it. And so we often say that flow states and flow consciousness are, are on the same spectrum of flow. They're just on opposite ends. And they actually pair really nicely together. And it's, they're not exclusive. Um, but typically, living in flow consciousness is a more all-encompassing experience and allows people to have like a sustained experience of flow versus just a temporary you know, uh, rocket ship into this altered state. Yeah. And when you're living in flow consciousness, you will typically experience more flow states and, and peak experiences throughout. But it's it's really living in this this way of being where everything you want and need to thrive comes to you effortlessly. Uh, you know, it really feels like life is conspiring in your favor. You're having exponential growth, uh, profound inner peace, and and the ability to maintain your center and surrender to life despite what's going on around you so it's a really beautiful way of being yes and what can we do to live more in that state of flow or can i say that state of flow consciousness can i bring them both together <laughs> yeah. yes yeah definitely um so you know there's, there's definitely a number of things we we basically have two core aspects of living in flow consciousness that we teach in the, the program is kind of like a, a, a meta view of what it takes to, to be in flow. And uh, that's inner flow and outer flow. And inner flow is really a process of deep um, rewiring of one's brain or consciousness or mind, depending on how you want to look at it, so that we're shifting out of a limited framework. A, a, we're shifting out of limited beliefs um, you know, and, and fear into a sense of expansiveness and into uh, a, a way of looking at the world, a set of perceptions that allow us to experience flow on an ongoing basis. This is deep rewiring out of limitation and into infinite possibility. And then on the other side, there's outer flow, which is really about how we track flow in real time out in the world. So it's not so much about the inner uh, perception, although that's definitely a part of it, but really about what decisions are we making? What actions are we taking to constantly stay in flow in our day-to-day -day lives? And so there's a lot of different things over that spectrum that people can do um, from, you know, doing uh, uh, deep work to rewire limiting beliefs into expansive positive beliefs. Um, and on the other side of the coin, you know, there's, there's a number of different practices that kind of center around a few different core pillars that allow people to really make that launch into flow. And it's a really holistic, integrated approach because we're not just working at the level of the mind. Uh, you know, we're working with these beliefs and emotional patterns and traumas at the mental, emotional, energetic, and physical level. So being really thorough in 
excavating it and reprogramming all of these things that are holding people back while um, putting in the more expansive um, reality altering, you know, flow inducing beliefs. Okay, and what are you finding it um, for most people? What is holding them back and how are they shifting in your program? What are they doing? Yeah, so I mean, most people basically are living under a mountain of limiting beliefs. Even people that have done a lot of work on themselves in personal development or spiritual development or you know, just in general, uh, they're, they're living under a mountain of limiting beliefs and a mountain of like emotional wounds and trauma. Um, and the nature of the unconscious and the psyche is that, you know, there's just many, 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 many layers to it. And, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of aspects that are very hidden from our, our conscious awareness. And so, so basically people, when people come to us, what we're doing is really helping them to kind of get out from under that. And beyond that too, to really develop the capacities that they need to be able to track flow. One of those is, is intuition. Um, another is really being able to anchor themselves in, in non-dual awareness um, and not a non-dual space of consciousness. And then a lot of other things that are kind of iterations of that or, or, um, or related to that in some way, shape or form that are really helpful for them kind of anchoring their perception into, into a higher level. And so, so most people are, are really just, they don't have, they either don't have the skills and tools. They never really receive, <laughs> when you go through our current yeah. educational system, it does not receive yeah flow it basically beats that out of you and, and makes you live in a box and so we basically are helping people kind of undo all the programming that they've gotten and then build out those skills that they need to really be able to operate at this at this higher level of reality yeah so really recognizing where all of this programming and conditioning comes from from our culture from media religion society or families like epigenetics you know shows that we're inheriting so many of these trauma patterns and so we we take on all of these things and without the awareness around it it's just subconsciously driving our behavior so really showing people how to reverse engineer what's happening in their world to show them where these emotional patterns and beliefs lie that are holding them back or keeping them stuck in some way Okay, so two questions. One is how would you raise your own kids knowing that about flow? And then how have, did you see that in your program, have people changed the way they raise their kids because they know about flow now? Yeah, absolutely. We have a, a lot of parents who um, are, are raising their children differently. Uh, they're homeschooling, they're traveling around the world with them and really kind of breaking out of the mold. Um, and I would say, you know, really letting go of the idea that we are there to teach our children and allowing them to become our teachers in many ways, because flow is really um, coming back to that childlike essence where your imagination is so fertile, you're really just living um, in this expansive place. So really um, having more of a reciprocity with our children. So, you know, we're obviously going to be passing on wisdom and, and structure for them to thrive, but also seeing them as our teachers and, and having it be a mutually beneficial relationship. Yeah. And, and I would add on to that too, you know, it's really challenging to like the, in an ideal world, you know, you, you would not, you would, you would uh, help your children avoid taking on any limiting beliefs or any emotional patterns or any trauma in any way, shape or form like that would be uh, the goal is to have them, you know, come through childhood, uh, not traumatized either from you or your culture or, or family or whatever, so that they are, they're able to kind of go out into the world and do what they need to do without all these, you know, uh, unconscious weights and balls and chains holding them back. But, you know, it's not, it's not really possible to do that. It's not really possible to protect people from that. And so, uh, or protect children in particular from that. And so what, what I would also do is, uh, instead of like, I mean, obviously I would try and be the best parent that I could be and be as loving as possible, but you know, that's kind of the name of the game in general, but what I would do in particular would be to teach the children as soon as they were ready, uh, tools for working with 
emotions and, and helping them to understand, you know, when they're feeling something to not repress it and to let it out and to express it and to have a healthy relationship with their emotions, because, you know, that way they're able to actually have um, uh, the, the, the skill and the know-how to actually deal with these things proactively in the moment. So if they do notice themselves taking something on that's not for their highest good, they're able to work with it in real time. And then that way they still get to have, there's no limitation on their experience, but they're also equipped to not get stuck in the mud like most people do and then end up playing out trauma, traumatic patterns their whole life. Absolutely. I mean, that is so, so important. And also, you know, as Justin said, no matter what you do as a parent, um, you're going to, you're going to show up and do your best, you know, given the tools that you have and even the most conscious parents are going to make mistakes and do things that aren't necessarily in service of, uh, of the child and just knowing that and being okay with that and knowing that everyone's getting the lessons that they need. And so many of our gifts come from, you know, our challenges. And so just trusting that, you know, everyone is having the experience that they're meant to have and, you know, not having to try and control and, and, prevent any bad, you know, quote unquote, bad things from yeah. happening because life is going to happen. They're going to face challenges. They're going to have hardships. They're going to have heartbreak. And, you know, these are all the necessary experiences that they need for their growth and evolution. So really just trusting in that and allowing life to unfold without trying to control it. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, so since you were mentioning challenges, what challenge for each of you have you had to go through to be at the point where you're at today? Like the biggest challenge, maybe if you want to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah. so many, there's, few, yeah. <laughs> there's so, so many, um, I guess for me, the, the biggest one, the most traumatic experience for me, which I also have enormous gratitude for now was the death of my brother 10 years ago. And that was a huge catalyst and, um, you know, for my awakening and so, so grateful for it. But at the time it was, it was one of the most painful, difficult things. And I'm, I'm still continuing to release, um, grief that's been kind of trapped in, in my body. And, um, so it's been an ongoing process, but, um, you know, that in particular was one of the most difficult things for me. But it set me on this path of just really getting to know myself in a deep, deep healing journey, which allowed me to come to this place of, of living in flow because I was willing to go into the darkness and go into the pain and, and face all of these feelings. Whereas, you know, um, for so long, I was, I was scared to face my feelings. It didn't feel safe to go into it. Um, so that I would say that's probably the biggest one for me. Yeah. And for, for me, I've kind of had two that have been particularly challenging, but we're also, you know, it's, it's ironic because they're your greatest, they're, they're your blessings and curses at the same time. You know, they're your greatest challenges, but I've also learned so much from having to deal with these and to, to navigate them and overcome them that that's part of what has allowed me to do what I'm doing today, like the, 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 what I've learned, the knowledge and the skills and the wisdom that I've gained through that. So challenges are blessings in disguise always. Um, but for me, my two biggest challenges have been um, when I was really little, I took on the belief that it's not safe to express myself because of experiences that I had that were where I, it wasn't safe to express myself. And I was getting either punished or, you know, having challenging interactions with people because I was trying to speak my truth. And so that basically caused me to shut that part of myself down uh, quite a bit for most of my young adult life. And it wasn't until I was about 20, that happened when I was like six or seven. And it, it wasn't until I was about 20, I started to snap out of it a bit. And in the last 15 years have been the process of really undoing that. And so, yeah, I definitely had to get over a fear of um, self-expression and, uh, you know, being on stage and being the center of attention and especially the nature of what we do with flow is very much an extension of, of either of us, our self-expression. It's, it's, you know, a modality that we both kind of created and discovered. And so, so it's really, you know, self-expression front and center. So my journey into teaching this material in the world has been uh, putting me face to face with that uh, 
uh, that limiting belief and that emotional pattern and trauma there and, and really causing me to go into it and have to overcome it. And it's been challenging at times, but also extremely rewarding. And the second thing too, is that um, I've also had, you know, we live on the planet at a time in history when we're, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually, there's a huge proliferation of toxins and chemicals in the environment. And um, because of the, when I was born, I was exposed to a lot of that as a child. And so that's also made it challenging in a lot of ways too, because I've had to deal with like really intense sensitivities to environmental toxins at points that have made, that have given me brain fog and made it, you know, fatigue and all these different things that have made it really challenging to, to do what I want to do. I kind of had to work through that, but it's also sent me on this beautiful healing journey where I've developed this really masterful knowledge about health and consciousness and that is part of what took me into doing deep healing work because I knew that I realized there was a mind body connection. And so, you know, it's been challenging at times, but it's also been really rewarding and it's, it's part of how I make my living now. So, you know, gotta love the duality of these challenges. Thank you guys for sharing. And I'm sorry for a loss, Jackie. And Thank you. Um, so when we're talking about challenges, but then being in a flow state or flow consciousness state, <laughs> Um, would you say we, if we are more in a flow consciousness state that we have, um, that challenges aren't as big anymore or that they aren't as frequent anymore, or do we just deal with them differently? I think it's both. So when you're really living in flow consciousness, the amount of challenges that you experience tend to be far less. Um, but there's also that you're more equipped to deal with them. And so you start to really see from this different lens. Um, so we've had a lot of our students experience the death of a loved one or profound heartbreak in relationship. Which, which is totally normal. Like, this yeah. is, just happens to everybody. This is, I mean, yeah. this is no, life. No, no, these things, these yeah. things are not going to stop happening because you're living in flow. There's going to be um, these challenging experiences, accidents, injuries, illness, uh, we're, we're always going to be facing these different things, but it's the perceptual lens that you're viewing them from. Whereas, you know, we've had a lot of our students go through these experiences with a much more peaceful, centered energy around it and accept yeah, it. So gratitude, it's, yeah, yeah and, and, and ultimately gratitude for these experiences because you're, you're looking for the, the gift in it and, um, and it really just being in that radical surrender and allowance of what's showing up, you just have a completely different experience of it without all of the stress and anxiety that, that normally would come with these challenging experiences. You can navigate them and really learn to dance with them. Yeah. That, there was a, a guy who has been through our programs, actually multiple levels of our programs. His name is Andre and he's happy for us to share this story, but he, um, maybe a year ago or so he had to get emergency heart surgery and get a stent put in his heart had like open heart surgery basically all of a sudden he was like a totally normal healthy guy and all of a sudden he had to get that and you know he went in the hospital and it was he didn't know if he was going to live and it was really you know uh, an alarming experience on a certain level but when he came out of it he, he the first thing he did was post in in our our members group and he's like i'm I just had the most incredible experience <laughs> and the way he wrote about it, you think he had just like, you know, taken a trip to his, um, mm -hmm. taking a vacation somewhere he's always wanted to go. But he was like, you know, I had, I was in such awe and gratitude for like how deeply and compassionately the nurses showed up and how masterfully the doctor helped me. And it made me reflect on all these unconscious patterns that I had picked up from my father who also had the same surgery. And now I'm going to write a book about it. And I just feel like I got a whole new lease on life and I feel amazing. And so, you know, it's like that we have a saying that challenges are inevitable, but struggle and suffering is optional. And it's like, that's what, that's what happens when you get into flow in this non-dual space is that you basically, you, you even like enjoy challenges. It's like you, you, when they happen, you're like, oh, great. I'm going to like something amazing is about to happen. I'm about to have a huge up level in my life, in my skills. I'm about to let go of some old pattern that's been holding on, that I've been holding on to forever. And you know that waiting on the other side of that challenge is even more flow, even more abundance, more joy, more happiness, more everything that you want is on the other side of challenges. So it's like when they show up, it's a huge gift. Yeah. Having that curiosity and positive and expectancy. And again, the willingness to go into 
you know, uh, these emotional states that are often perceived as negative. And, you know, I think what happens is like people experience tremendous challenges when they're not willing to do that, you know, and it's like, when they resist. Yeah, yeah, when you're in resistance and um, to what's showing up or, you know, just ignoring the signs and, and symptoms, then, you know, like each time, you know, the, the challenge gets greater until you're willing to actually pay attention and start to, to look within because I, I believe we're having these challenges for our growth and evolution. So it's like you'll, you'll get smacked by the spiritual two by four at some point if you are ignoring all of the smaller signs along the way. Yeah, so what can you tell our audience, maybe like three things or one thing that they can do so that they can live more in the flow? Yeah, uh, so a really great one, a really good entry point to starting to live in flow is to um, just such a shift out of the mind and get more in touch with uh, your intuition, which oftentimes shows up for people more through their felt sense. And when I say felt sense, I'm really talking not so much about your emotions per se, but your feelings, like something is feeling good or joyful or inspiring or whatever, like, like positive feeling states are a really great way to start getting into flow. Most people, um, they're trapped, like we said, under the mountain of their limiting beliefs. And so they're, they're as such, they're trying to navigate lives with their minds all the time and trying to figure out what is the best choice to make and trying to figure out, you know, think four steps ahead and trying to plan for everything. And they're basically just trying to control the crap out of their lives because they're really afraid to let go because they think that if they do, then they'll lose their safety and their livelihood and all this stuff. So that's how most people operate in the world. They're in this very like limited kind of mental state of trying to control everything. Um, but flow is something you access much more through your intuition among other things and to do that you need to start using a different system you need to start using your intuitive navigation system and one of the ways to do that is to start feeling things more because your intuition uh, speaks most loudly through your feelings and so um so when you start to tune into feeling and let that guide you instead then you start to get more and more into flow but sometimes your feelings conflict with what your mind tells you you know your feelings might say, uh, you know, go to the beach and hang out today by the ocean and be in the sun. But your mind says, no, you got this huge to-do list of things to do and you got to get that done before you can go out to the beach. And so people will oftentimes brush aside their feelings because they go, they, they, their mind telling them something different. But what the nature of flow is such that like, it, it's non-linear. So you don't know why you're being guided to go to that beach. You might meet someone there. <laughs> you know, your, your, your next romantic partner or might have, a, you know, a job for you or, you know, whatever it is that you're seeking in life, like you don't know that you're not going to find it at the beach or that that decision is not going to send you down a completely different path in life that's going to ultimately lead you into places that you didn't expect to be where the resource is. So, so basically with flow, you know, we're, we're shifting out of like this super linear, uh, you know, to-do list based reality and moving into a much more open reality where we're guiding, we're letting our feelings guide us, we're letting our, our intuition guide us towards whatever it is that we want. And there's some really interesting science behind that, but that in a nutshell is one of the, one of the easy practices for people to do. Well, I would Easier say simple yeah. rather than easy because <laughs> the more compounded you are with these limiting beliefs and emotional patterns and things, it's harder to access that felt sense so that's why you know we do so much focus on on the inner work piece and flow because a lot of people are are not you know attuned to that anymore we all come into the world with this innate gift but then it's conditioned out of us so we learn not to trust it because we're um you know our society values the rational logical mind rather than the felt sense and and it often doesn't make sense so we don't trust it and so you know, I would say it's a, a simple practice rather than an easy one. But when you start to really shift into that, it will quickly show you all of the places where you believe things are not possible or you're still operating from this conditioning and programming. And it'll really show you the limits of your, your comfort zone. Absolutely. OK, thank you. And then, Justin, you were talking about research about intuition. How can you research something like intuition and what research has been done and what have you found? 
Yeah, so there's a lot of interesting research that's been done and um, people just come up with really creative ways to test it. Um, there's different ways that you can start to measure intuition, intuitional capacity. Um, you know, there, it does, it does, uh, it is something that you can test and, um, you know, the ability that people have to basically, you know, read into the future and to, uh, to, to collect non-local data. Um, there's a whole field that deals with this and uh, basically, one of the most interesting experiments in, in my pers in my per, uh, perspective is that is this one that was done by this professor um, John Mihalaski. I think his first name is John. It's been a minute since mm -hmm. I referenced it. Yeah, and he was a professor at the New York Institute of Technology, and he basically did a study where he took five thousand CEOs and he gave them all tests measuring their level of intuitional capacity, and then he tracked their performance in business over time. And what he found was that the CEOs who tested to have the highest level of intuitional capacity um, were the ones that performed best in terms of the success of running their businesses on average, doubling their profitability or more over the course of like a three or four year period. So really, really significant business growth, like tremendous business, business growth. And the CEOs who tested to have low or no intuitional capacity had the same success rates uh, at running their business as basically random chance. <laughs> so if you didn't have intuition and you're running your business, like your, your chances of being successful were completely random. And uh, so, you know, it painted a really clear picture of just how powerful intuition is in guiding you towards success in general in your life or your business or both. And the reason that this, it, the reason that, that that study showed those results is because uh, you know, other researchers studying the nature of, of intuition have found, and, and just the way that the mind works in general, is that on average, um, your conscious mind can, or your rational mind rather, can process anywhere, depending on the numbers you use, anywhere from about 20 to 60,000 bits of data per second. Your intuition, on the other hand, can process anywhere between 4 million and 60 million bits of data per second. And so, uh, so what you see there is an orders of magnitude jump in processing capacity between the rational mind and our intuition. I mean, literally, you're talking like 10,000 X. I understand that, but how, how do you measure your rational mind versus your intuition? How is that measured scientifically? Yeah, so basically what they do is they just look at the raw processing power of these different, you know, there's different types of thinking, type one and type two thinking. And they basically okay. look at the amount of, bits of data that you can actually process consciously and then what's going on intuitively in your in your system and so basically because there's such an order of magnitude difference what's happening is that your intuition is basically uh processing like 10,000 x more data about reality and it's using that to make decisions versus your conscious mind which is basically pretty you know taking a very meager amount of data to figure out what to do and since most people operate from their conscious mind, what, is, what ends up happening is that they get, they lock themselves into this box where they really have no idea what's going on. They're using a really bad data set to make decisions where your intuition is by a large margin is going to have an infinitely better data set to pull from. So you make better decisions when you use your intuition than you do when you use your mind. And that's, that's one of the key things to flow is that when you use your intuition for as many decisions as possible, the quality of your decision making goes up so much that you enter into a completely different, you know, uh, way of moving through life where you're not in struggle and suffering all the time, but you're having life actually start to conspire in your favor. And it starts to get really effortless because we have this inherent bias towards picking the path that's most effortless through life, because that's the path on which we're technically the safest. And there's a bias in existence towards allowing living beings to thrive and to have everything that they need. So so there's this bias that there, that there is in the mind and reality towards flow, but we get, we snap ourselves out of it and we let our mind dominate too much of our, our reality and our decision-making. That is incredible. I love that research. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and now I wanted to ask you guys, both of you guys, do you believe we create reality with our thoughts or is there also some research that you know about or some of your own opinions? Well, we, we think it's deeper than the layer of thought. So we work with a, a framework called BETDAR, and that's beliefs, emotions, thoughts, decisions, actions, and results or reality. So, um, you know, most people think 
if they've seen the secret or um, are into the law of attraction that their thoughts are creating their reality, but we're asking, you know, where are those thoughts coming from? Right. Mm. So there, there's deeper layers and, you know, we believe that the, the layer of belief is where everything emerges from. So it's really that your beliefs are creating your experience of reality and your beliefs give way to your emotional states, which give rise to your, your thoughts. So, um, so really working to see what those beliefs are that are creating these perceptual frames with which you're viewing life. So that's one layer of how we see reality creation. Yeah, you, you, you are creating your reality. You're creating your own individual reality within the context of a larger collective reality. So you're not necessarily creating everyone else's reality, but even within this larger picture, you're still experiencing your own reality within that bigger a bigger collective. I think that's sometimes when people get tripped up when they're thinking about creating their reality. Like, if I'm creating my reality, then I'm creating everything. And that means I'm creating all of the suffering that's going on in a exactly. country, you know, 50, mm -hmm. 5,000 miles away from me. And it's like, well, that's a, that's a bit of a stretch, but you are definitely having your own experience of reality in this larger context of reality that we're experiencing. And so that's what we mean by you're creating your reality is that, you know, you see this all the time. You know, you can, like Santa Barbara, where we, where I live, is a perfect example of this, where you have, you know, uh, some of the highest, like there's more billionaires living here than, than pretty much anywhere else on the planet. And yet there's a huge homeless population as well uh, for a city this size. And so you have this, you have the same, the same location in space and time on the planet. And you have people that have no money and you have people that have all the money and they're sharing like the same, you know, they're sharing the same like physical location on the planet. So two completely different realities, but in the same space right so this is what we mean is that based on your belief structures your emotional conditioning your and then that by extension your thoughts and the decisions that you make you're going to choose a specific path through life based on those it's going to either result in you having you know extreme abundance or you know, maybe you end up in the middle class or maybe you end up in a corporate job where you might you know end up completely opting out of the system and deciding that you don't want to be part of you know the current capitalist system or you might end up as a homeless person or anything in between. There's, there's 9 billion different ways to do this currently. And so, uh, so that's, that's what we're saying. And, you know, the, it's, it's no longer a question of, oh, that's a nice idea or theory. Uh, pretty much every major field of science is now coming to the conclusion that we're absolutely creating our reality from neuroscience to quantum physics to psychology and neurobiology. It's just, you, you can't escape it. You know, Carl Jung, is um, famous for famously quoted as saying, you know, um, uh, those who don't explore the unconscious, you know, will be. I'm totally butchering this quote, but he's he basically says like, you know, those who don't th those who don't probe into the unconscious are are doomed to be, you know, the victims of it. They're they're doomed to be the victims of it and call it fate. There's there's no fate. We determine our fate, but our fate is determined by our unconscious belief structures and our emotional conditioning. So. If you, that's why we work there with flows, because if you shift that and everything else shifts and your whole reality shifts, because that's where your reality is emerging from. Okay. So if you said faith is determined by us, who determines if we come to this earth and what's your opinion on that? Does life end here and start here? Or do you have a different yeah. opinion? <laughs> awesome. Love where you're thinking. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, that's getting into a pretty multidimensional conversation there and, you know, branching out into to the realm of the transpersonal. And, uh, you know, it's my, it's my personal belief. And I think there's a lot of evidence to show this is the case too. If you look at a lot of the research into near death experiences and to a lot of actually medical research when people die on the operating table and, uh, and they, they literally, their heart stops, their brain stops, and they're, they're, they're clinically dead. Like they pronounce clinically dead and they go on to have these experiences, you know, um, where they leave their bodies and they float up out, uh, you know, as, as a spirit or a soul floating out of their body. And they start to have all these experiences like where, they, like, for example, there's a really interesting case study where um, a woman was like having like open heart surgery or brain surgery or something. And she died during the surgery. And when that happened, she popped out of her body, her physical body, and she started to float up as a spirit up over the top of the hospital and as she did she like was seeing this the the um the roof of the hospital all the equipment that was up there and the air conditioning units and and when she did she actually like saw a barcode 
on one of the air conditioning units that had this like 10 digit string of letters and numbers. And somehow, and she was out, she was dead for like five or six minutes or something like that, 10 minutes. And somehow they, they uh, were able to resuscitate her and she, she snapped back into her body. And she said, when she, when, when they resuscitated her, she just all of a sudden fell back into her body like a rock. And she, she woke up and then they finished the surgery. And then they were talking to her about what happened afterwards because she had clinically died. And she's like, well, I, she was telling them what had happened where she floated up out of her body up over the ceiling or, or excuse me, over the roof of the, of the hospital. And she's like, yeah, and you know, I actually remember what I saw up there. I saw this air conditioning unit and it had, it had this barcode on it and, it, and she read them the barcode. And then somebody went up to the roof of the hospital <laughs> and went to that air conditioning unit and read the barcode and she had gotten the number 100% correct. And it was like a 10 digit number. And if you know anything about statistics, like a 10 digit number, the chances of somebody guessing that correctly are like one in a billion or one yeah. in a trillion or something. They're really extreme. So, you know, there's all kinds of, of studies that have been done over people that have had these experiences that shows that their consciousness survives after their physical body dies. There's a huge body of literature showing this. It's been published in peer-reviewed journals. And so it points very clearly to this, this phenomenon of, of non-local consciousness, right? This, this merging uh, perspective on consciousness, which is that our consciousness is non-local. It means that it exists after we die. And for me, that science, I mean, I believe this regardless of the science, but for me, that science paints an unequivocal picture that we absolutely exist before we come into this body and after we leave it. And so I do believe that there's an intentional choice to incarnate at that level, at that higher level of our soul or this, this more expanded level of consciousness where we choose to come into physical form. And we know a bit what we're getting into when we do that. Yeah, there's just, there's too many stories um, of, of exactly what Justin's saying, like people that recall, like they were in a traumatic car accident and then they can tell all of these details, you know, from, from the accident when they were technically dead. And, um, and it, there's so much uniformity in these stories of near death experiences or, uh, lives between lives that, you know, it's, it's really hard to argue with that. And I've had, you know, some of my own embodied experiences that, um, aren't necessarily like a near death experience, but, uh, mirror that same, experience and so for me it, it's absolutely uh my belief that that's exactly you know our consciousness lives on and we ch our souls choose to incarnate over and over so do you believe that our souls maybe they're in the perfect state of flow but then we forget about it and we have to relearn it <laughs> yes yeah, basically. <laughs> okay and who are you guys role models is there anyone doing like the same research or, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of our role models we've invited to be <laughs> our advisory our, board, our advisory board at our Institute, um, because, uh, they're just amazing humans that are really pushing the boundaries, um, in terms of a, a lot of, uh, you know, different aspects of flow flow, it, as you may have gathered from this interview is a, a very multidisciplinary, uh, uh, study and it involves a lot of different fields across a huge spectrum of, um, psychology to neuroscience to quantum physics to you know spirit different shamanic yeah lineages. different shamanic lineages you know uh, transpersonal psychology uh, you know different spiritual traditions and spiritual philosophies so there's there's really a, a ton in there so there's not one person that i personally look up to who's like got it all dialed in but there's people that we look up to in different domains so one that comes to mind often is uh, jude curvan who's uh, on our board and she's a brilliant, um, uh, she's a PhD in archeology span and a master's in quantum physics. And she studied with a lot of the original quantum physicists back in the day. And I think she was like the first woman to get a degree in quantum physics. And, uh, she's, she was also like the, the most senior businesswoman in the UK at one point. And, um, she's just a brilliant, brilliant, uh, researcher, scientist. She's very, very spiritually aware. And so she has this ability to blend all of these different layers of reality that are normally totally separate and come up with these really unique insights into how reality works. And so, uh, and she's just an awesome person. So much fun. Just she's ball just of light. so yeah. much fun. Ball of joy. So, um, so yeah, so she's, she's somebody, and then we have mentors in the, in the business space and systems theory space that are, you know, helping us to think about how flow can be applied at scale. And, uh, yeah, just, just some of the names that pop up to mind are, uh, David Hofstadter, 
uh, David Gershon. Um, Our friend group, basically, and uh, you know, for me, Dr. Lori Layden uh, is one of our dear friends and mentors. I call her a friend tour, and she's one of the most renowned trauma specialists in the world, working with genocide victims in Rwanda and uh, Aborigines in Australia to heal ancestral trauma, and working with the school shootings and just doing such profound work in the world. And, you know, we're, we're blessed to have her as one of our advisors as well. So we have a really solid community of um, support in all of these different realms. Beautiful, that sounds amazing. Okay, so what is next for you guys? What's planned? Um, yeah, <laughs> what's next for us? Um, so we are launching uh, a new program um, we've been doing a lot of work with entrepreneurs over the years. Our, our program has naturally attracted uh, entrepreneurs because it's a really good fit with uh, how they tend to perceive and live life. And so now we're formalizing that into specific uh, training just for uh, founders and entrepreneurs and solopreneurs and people that just are in any kind of entrepreneurial pursuit or discipline. We're, we're starting a program just for them to basically help them scale their impact and their success and their, their abundance and everything about you know the entrepreneurial path as effortlessly as possible and we've had some really stellar uh, uh, um, case studies over the years of people that have worked with us along those lines and so we're, we're launching into that and continuing to do research into decoding the mechanics of consciousness and intuition and what else Jackie? yeah well you know just when you were talking about the founder flow it, we work with so many incredible impact entrepreneurs and and really you know, it, the importance of elevating the consciousness of the, the people who are working to create these new systems feels so important. So the people that are working with exponential technologies and, um, you know, AI, machine learning, VR, creating the new financial systems, whether it's, you know, working with the blockchain and cryptocurrencies and um, creating new political systems and new healthcare systems, really working to uh, support the evolution of consciousness for the people who are creating these new systems is really inspiring. Uh, we're also creating our train the trainer program. So we currently have students in 40 something countries. Uh, we, we get messages all the time from people who want to translate it into Hungarian or some other Spanish. language. And, um, you know, there's, there's a demand from our students who want to be able to take these tools and techniques and principles, our whole methodology into their communities, work with their clients. So we're, we're currently working on building out that training program. So that way, you know, the work can scale and people can, you know, be the, uh, the steward of this work, you know, for their own communities. Beautiful. And uh, how can our audience find you guys? Yeah, uh, flowconsciousness.com or just Google Flow Consciousness Institute. Um, you'll find us and most of the important things that we do are uh, right there front and center. We got, we're just launching a whole new content section of the website to uh, share a lot of the different things we've been putting out and there's some free trainings on there. And yeah, it's a great place to start. Awesome. Sounds good. Thank you guys so, 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 so much for this conversation. It was really enlightening. It was really great to have you guys on here. Our pleasure. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Love this episode of Mind Your Subconscious? Subscribe, rate, and leave a review on whichever platform you're listening. It's very much appreciated. Thank you so much. Catch our next episode every Monday.